This week, um, what I want to do is I want to continue with what we've been uh, doing for a little while called Seeing Red. We know that the words of Jesus in Bibles, most Bibles, not all of them, his specific words that he says are, are written in red. And what we've said is if you're seeing red, you'll never look the same again. You'll never look at yourself the same, and you'll never look at others the same. Because what happens often with the words of Jesus, he says things that you just kind of go, what did he say? What did he mean? I mean, what is it? And we want to look deeper into just the words, seeing red, taking us right into Christmas Eve as we prepare. So uh, have we seen some of this stuff around lately, right? We see this, especially at Christmas, peace, joy, love. And we see like the same thing, same thing with this, like wishing you peace, joy, and love at this whole time. What's interesting to me, uh, uh, writing this message, it was um, written based out of a conversation I had with a friend. And uh, it was a weird uh, uh, meeting with him. Uh, it was a little weird of a lunch time, uh, although the, the, the sandwiches were, were incredible. Um, it was sitting and it was talking about how I, I may not love him, how we, we've been friends for years and how uh, just, just a love and uh, how it's just weird between us or whatever. And it would all stem from uh, because I didn't agree with the way he was living. So what I've found since having this, this lunch meeting uh, about, you know, peace, joy, and, and love um, was that a lot of people in society and culture are beginning and have for a long time, but maybe some of us are just noticing it. They're trying to dictate to us what peace, joy, and love are, not based on the words of Jesus, but based on culture. And there's a, there's a constant flow that's happening that if you love me, well then, well then how, do you, how can you disagree with me? How can you love me if you don't agree with me? How can you love me if you don't necessarily support what I'm thinking, my theology, my methodology, my lifestyle, whatever it is? And that's not what Jesus said. What Jesus said is, no, actually... It doesn't impress me to love the ones that love you. It actually is impressive uh, to love those who despise you. Uh, but culture has a way, especially recently, uh, of just saying, well, if you don't agree and you don't support, I don't understand how you can love. So this morning, for just a little bit, I want to look at some words of Jesus and make sure that we as believers and followers of Christ, are on the same page when it comes to what is love. When it, when we're on the same page when it comes to what, what does love look like. Uh, so that we, because uh, if you're not deliberate, you could just be swept up into the flow. So we've got to be real careful. It's interesting to me the premium that Jesus puts on relationships. That's where we have to start. Jesus is speaking here to the disciples, it words in red, and he says this. Listen, just want to let you know, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, uh, basically if you're coming into the presence of God, church, if you're coming into, not that that's the only place God is, we know it's not, but one of the things we want to come to do together is come and worship together. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, you're coming to church, you're offering your gift. What it means is who you are, your dreams, your aspirations. You're offering your heart, Lord, uh, maybe protect my heart, forgive my heart, cleanse my heart, my mind. It's a very rabbinic way of saying the whole person. If you're offering your gift at the altar, something that you're giving to God, your time, your mind, your heart, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there... At the altar, you remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift. Leave your agenda. Leave what you came to church for. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. To which 90% of us go, what? Seriously. Because that person's an idiot. <laughs> And it's interesting because when you start to look at the words of Jesus, Jesus doesn't mention whose fault it is. 
Jesus doesn't mention who's starting the drama. Uh, Jesus doesn't mention hurt or pain. See, there's a premium in the economy of Christ. There's a premium put on horizontal relationships. And to the degree that you work on your horizontal relationships is to the degree that you receive from God through you to other people. See, Jesus says here, look, coming to church, coming together, offering stuff, I love it, it's great. But if you're here and you realize that there's something weird between you and someone else, I want you to go over there. I want you to go to that person and see if you can be reconciled. Now, don't get me wrong. You may not reconcile. That person may not want to reconcile at all. I don't know why you're calling me. I hate you. I don't know why you want to be around. Listen, it's no hope for our... That's fine. That's not our issue. That's theirs, according to Scripture. See, the issue in Scripture is making every attempt to reconcile, to bring back together, every attempt to put back. We're not talking about blame and fault. We're talking about our behavior being altered horizontally. Scripture's talking about our behavior being altered horizontally because of our vertical relationship with Christ. I mean, I have instances where I've practiced this. Humbled yourself. You bite a hole in your lip. Anybody ever been through that? I'm going to call them. Hey, man, hadn't talked to you in a while. I know last time we talked it was weird. It didn't go well. Yeah. So? You got anything else to say different than you said last time? No, I just want to make sure we're cool. I mean, you know, well, I don't want to deal with you. Great. Uh, later on, the Apostle Paul says, in, in every way that it is in your control, get along with one another. Jesus immediately raises the bar and says, look, <laughs> when you're in church, when you're coming to the altar, when you're coming into the presence of God. When you're coming there, make sure you don't have something. Make sure something, because uh, what I had to find, and I'm gonna, I want to be transparent with you guys, listen, what I had to find when I first started like really getting into God and church, um, and I kind of felt, it felt stale to me, and I don't mean a distant God. I mean, a, a understanding that God wanted to be involved in my relationships, my life, my thoughts, everything, personal relationship. I would go to church and I'd be like, man, I just don't, I just don't feel that different leaving. I mean, it's cool and all, some cool people, some weirdos, some cool, some then on. And, and what will happen, what happened to me was I would start to point horizontally at things. Like, I don't like the way he speaks. I don't like the music. I don't like that guy. I don't like this. I don't like the way they do that. I don't like that. What I found, for me, was it had less to do not receiving from God in his house direction, forgiveness, mercy, direction. <laughs> it had less to do with what was happening horizontally and had everything to do with what was, that was happening vertically. I wasn't allowing God to guide and direct me because I wasn't practicing this principle of Scripture. Had a lot of tumultuous relationships in my life, including family ones. But it wasn't until I went and said, look, how can we get along as best we can? How can we, da -da? and sometimes it never happened. It never came back. But what I did is I practiced scripture and coming into the presence of God took on a whole new light. Uh, Jesus says, look, if you come to the church, you gotta check it, you gotta be careful. You got to, because if you're coming and doing all this stuff, that's great. Go and reconcile. And then he says this later on, words in red. And this is tough. And I want to encourage you. Don't, don't push back. Don't push back right now. Just lean back. And let's discover some things in God's word. He says this. He goes, look, guys, I got a new commandment. A new commandment. To some of us, it would be like, oh, gosh, not another one. Can we just keep it down to 10? That would be awesome. I got a new commandment. The audience he's talking to is actually some of the Jewish people that had begun to serve uh, God and follow the ways of the kingdom. They had over 600 laws that they had to practice to feel as though God loved them. Sound familiar? 
that had over 600 little practices that they had to execute on, live through, so that they would feel like God was pleased with them. Huh, sound familiar? One of my favorites is, if you were the first person to drink at a table for dinner, you had to take the drink and you had to strain it once through a strainer, take that cup, give it to someone else, and they had to strain the drink again, and then you could serve it. Look, that ain't ever going to happen in my house. We slam drinks down. Not those kind of drinks. That's weird, right? Okay, watch. So he says, look, I got a new commandment for you. I've got a new thing. You've got all these laws. And I'm not saying those are bad, but you're putting this high price, this premium on all of these laws so that you would feel accepted and you would have God's attention. Well, I have a new one for you that's going to trump them all. See, that's the context. I've got a new one. He says, I give you love. A new commandment, I give you love one another. I'm pretty good with that. See, like right there, if the scripture would have ended, I'm like, look, dude, I'm good. I love people. I love them. But then he says this line, uh, as I have loved you. Wah, wah. See, that's, that's, that, that's a whole other level. <laughs> it's like, oh, love people. Dude, I'm a lover. <laughs> I'm Italian. Love is in my blood. Oh, no, no, no. No, not the way culture taught you. See, get it? Not the way culture taught you or teaches you. Not the way your family does. Not the way, no, no. <laughs> the way I have done to you. The way I have shown you. The way uh, that I have given you an example. New commandment I give you to love one another. Uh, as I have loved you, so you must. No, it's not an option. When Jesus says, so you must, perk your ears up, perk our ears up, so you must love one another. All men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Years and years ago, I would have thought, how would someone know that someone is a Christian? Well, every time the doors of the church are opened, they are there. Uh, that's, that's cool, but they are, let me just tell you. They have memorized the book of James. They can recite it and spew it out at any given moment. Uh, okay. They are so generous. They give all the time. They serve. They don't serve in those fluffy serving places. They serve in the nursery. <laughs> they serve in the parking lot. Those are real Christians. Listen, all of those things are important, and I'm not discounting them. You cannot fully reach who God wants you to be without practicing the things I just mentioned. <laughs> but Jesus wants to make sure that we don't get confused with those things opposed to love. He, he, he says, all men will, you, will know you are my disciples if you love one another. See, the calling card is love. And sometimes it can get weird and cloudy. See, he says, you could know a lot of things, but I just want to make sure you understand. It's all for naught. Hey, look at this. This is interesting. The Apostle Paul later takes the words of Jesus in red. And this is what I want to do for the next just few minutes. I want to look at this. Just so we're not confused, so we don't get swept up with the current of culture about love. Don't push back. Just lean back a little bit. Paul says this describing love to a church. To a church in Corinth. Had a lot of sexual identity issues. Had a lot of other God issues. Because most of the people in the Corinthian church when this was written did not come from a long line of being in church. They were heathens. They were Gentiles. They didn't really have, all they had was culture influencing them. The church is getting weird with a lot of believing, a lot of different things. So Paul swoops in and he says, let me just get us on the same page when I talk about living together. When I talk about living together as believers. When I talk about how we interact with those who are not following the ways of the kingdom. He says this about love. If I speak in tongues of men and or angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. 
Look, I've got all this great stuff to tell you. I've got all these great things that I want to protect you from. I have all of these great things I want to communicate to you. I've got all these experiences. I speak in tongues of the things, the words that are coming out of my mouth. They're so important. They'll change your life. They're going to save you a lot of heartache. You're going to really get a whole lot smarter if you'd lend your ear to my words. Hmm. Paul says, but if it's not delivered, if it's not spoken, if it's not served up on a platter called love, unlike a clanging symbol, no one's going to get it. You want to define love? Really what Paul is saying here is without love, all that I say is ineffective. If I'm not serving it up, if I'm not telling someone, look, you got to be really careful, bro you got to be really careful about what you're about to do or what you're about to say. Look, son, if you want to do this, don't. If you want to be this, don't do this. If it's not served up in the spirit and delivered in the mechanism, by the mechanism of love, everything, what Paul is saying is everything I say is ineffective. Little side note, bunny trail number one. You ready? Parents. And if you're thinking about having kids, this is great. If you're single, look for this in the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. Parents, a big lesson I had to learn many years ago. My kids are older now. But many years ago, because I like things a certain way. And so does God. There are, there's, there's ways there are things are done correctly. It's biblical. But I can be so over the top. I can be so dogmatic I can be so stern sometimes. This is the lesson I would say. How come I keep saying, do this? They, they don't do it. I'm like, that's it. Take out the belt. I just We're going to do something. Lock him in the closet. Throw a T-bone in there. Put him in the room. Whatever it is. What I had to learn many years ago, when we're looking and raising our children... Whether even if you're an older parent now, and if you, I want you to look for this if you're single and the person you're thinking about marrying... What I had to learn was, based on scripture, without love, all that I say is ineffective. I had to ramp up the level of deposits I made in my children's life of affirming who they are, affirming who they could be, affirming their gifts, affirming all of the great things that I could see in them. And then all of a sudden, when I corrected something they said or, corrected some, or correcting something they did, all of a sudden it began to take root. Why? Because I had to learn to deliver what I was saying through the mechanism of love. And it takes a whole lot more effort, maybe just for me, it takes a whole lot more effort to look and go, hey, These are the great qualities about you. You're so good at this. You're so good at that. But do me a favor. Don't do this because it's not going to be good for you. All of a sudden, oh, it started taking root. My words started to be more effective. I thought it was the punishment. (laughs) Not that there doesn't need to be consequences. But understand, consequences without reaffirming Through love, not going to work, according to Scripture. Because all that I say, I speak in tongues of angels and men. Oh, i got all this great stuff to tell you. But if I don't do it through love, I love what he says here. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, but have not love, I'm nothing. i got all this wisdom. I know all this stuff. Can I tell you, this is the thing that for years kept me out of church. This is the the one principle that kept me from uh, being in a personal relationship with Christ. Let me tell you why. Because the Christians that I met looked like they sucked on a lemon for four days. I was like, I don't want what you have. I can be like that without God. Uh, You missed it. (laughs) I can be like that without God. Our job as believers is through our behavior to get people closer to the cross so that God changes them, not us. See? So what happens, I'm looking at these people and I'm like, you want me to, you're inviting me to church? You act like you already don't care. I got a whole bunch of people in my life that already show me they don't care. And if that's what you look like and that's what you act like after you go to church, I don't need church because I'm already that way. (laughs) It's funny. 
because Paul says the same thing. I got all this knowledge. I got all these experiences. I figured it out. You're the Einstein of Christianity. You know the Greek and the Hebrew. You've studied all of those things are great, but Paul turns around and says, but if I have all of those things and all the brain knowledge and everything, if I don't deliver it through love, here, this is really what he says, without love, all that I know is incomplete. (laughs) Without delivering it through love, it doesn't matter what you know. Because it ain't going to work. It ain't going to be conveyed. See, the economy in God's kingdom, the economy in God's kingdom is our horizontal relationship with God reflects in our vertical, in our vertical relationship with God reflects in our horizontal relationships with people. See, that's God's economy. So, so you can say, oh, I love people. I love them. I love them in my heart. I love them. I'm praying for them. I'm doing all oh, it's great, but it better show up in your behavior. That's, that's, it's, it's interesting to me. That's why the Bible says knowledge puffs up. Because when you have all this knowledge and you're not able to convey it to others through the mechanism of love, you get puffed up. The rest of that scripture says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Build something up, you got to be deliberate with it. you got to touch it, you got to feel it, you got to construct it. Paul says, I can know all these things, but without love, all that I know is incomplete. He says, and if I have faith that can move mountains... If I have faith that can move mountains, if I, if I know, and we're in America, guys, here's the deal. There's very few, if any at all, pockets in this country that has not heard the story of Jesus. See, I had to move from knowing, oh, I know, I know who God is, I know what he's about, yeah, I gave his son, th- three days, rose again, yeah, forgiveness is awesome. Four Hail Marys, three Our Fathers, ten candles. I'm good. I'm back in, bro. Mm -mm. See, it's more, Paul says, it's more than just believing. See, that's what Paul's saying. You just can't believe because everybody believes. Can we be clear about Scripture? We're in America. Everybody knows and believes in God, but it hasn't permeated to the level where it changes our behavior. And and just so we know, Scripture is clear that our spiritual enemy, who who exists only to steal, kill, and destroy every good thing in our life, what I hate is he knows more of God and more about Scripture than we do. Because that's Bible. And Paul says, don't get caught up in just knowing. See, what what he really means is this. Without love, all that I believe is insufficient. Without love, all I believe is insufficient. Because if you can't transfer it to a behavior, then what is it? What's it for? He he goes on to say, if I surrender, and it was one of my favorites, if I surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I I gain nothing. If I strive to attain, and I want to be clear on something, if I strive for the new position at my job, if I strive to have a bigger home for my family, none of those things are wrong. None of those things are wrong. If I strive to accomplish, nothing nothing wrong with that. If I strive to be the best, absolutely nothing wrong with that. If I strive, if I I work to be better at so-and-so, it's awesome. But he says, but I don't have love. I, I gain nothing. You see, it's interesting. He says, without love, all that I accomplish is inadequate. For years, uh, because I didn't grow up necessarily in church, and I didn't grow up in ministry, I love, uh, I love accomplishing. I just love it. There's something about it. It energizes me. It, oh, my goodness. I mean, I just I absolutely love it. And I would look back at my life about 15 years ago, and, and I'm about to save everybody like thousands of dollars in therapy, so lean in on this one, okay? Um, and I was like, man, I just feel completely unfulfilled. I, I feel completely um, just still empty. 
But you could look at my life, my family, and go, well, yeah, how? You have this, and you've done this, and you've done, yeah, I know, but it just feels like. It's very important who you're transparent with. I had a great relationship, still do, with this person in my life. And they give you the biblical perspective, not the psychology perspective. Hello? The biblical perspective. And they went, yeah, it's because you don't, where do you love people? And it hit me like a ton of bread. What do you mean? What do you mean, where do I love people? I love people all the time. I said hello to some lady at the coffee shop the other day. She, she smiled back. She loves me. <laughs> and we began to put a little skin on what it was. See, all, that's where this statement comes. Without love, all that I accomplish is inadequate. Because until I understood that the Christian life wasn't circles that pointed inward, the Christian life was starts in the middle and goes outward. Until I understood that, it really helped me get beyond the, uh, let's call it the blues. And, and to this day, when I get that way, I take a survey of my life and I just go, Oh, I'm not loving in this area. And the minute I do that, it's like my mind is renewed. Because we can all accomplish stuff in different areas. Whether it's raising families, whether it's creating businesses, whether it's being successful, whatever. We can all accomplish. But according to Scripture, all that you accomplish will be inadequate if you're not expressing it and using it through love. I'm, I'm sitting with this, this guy, and, 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 you know, I'm just sitting there. We're having a, a, what I thought was a good time. And I had planned to pay the bill for lunch, by the way. So we're sitting, and he's just mad, and how can you disagree with me, and how could you disagree with me on this point? And I'm, I'm trying to keep my cool. You guys would have been proud of me. I, I didn't really say anything. I just kind of, uh-huh, because the fries, I had a lot of French fries. So that was good. And just kind of fill my mouth with that other than stuff coming out, you know what I'm saying? So, and I just go, man, I just don't, I just don't, I just don't agree. He, he, uh, he, his car at the time was uh, broken down. And I, and I didn't know that through conversation that afternoon. We found out. And I said, well, that's cool. I said, if we can end a little early, I'll go drive you. His response was, why would you drive me? We disagree about everything that I, in my life right now. What? What? We disagree about everything going on in my life, and you want to drive me? Yes, because I love you. See, be careful, because society will begin to trick you as a believer and follower of Christ. That you can't disagree with someone's methodology, spirituality, lifestyle, and still love them. But meanwhile, Jesus gives us the example. No, dude, I... What I'm doing for you isn't a result of you. It's behavior modification based on the love that I've experienced from Christ. You actually have nothing to do with it. Because if you had something to do with it, you'd be walking, not driving. <laughs> so I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just you know. <laughs> Let's move on. Sorry, I lost it right there. Without love, all that I comment is inadequate. Where are we? I don't even know where we are. I love this. Paul concludes it. He, he, goes, he goes, love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. Love never fails. Let me put it in capital letters. That's tough because we don't see that a lot today. No end to its trust, no fading of its hope. That can outlast anything. Love never fails. It's because Paul has the image, the definition of love in Jesus. See, Paul could say it never ends. It never fails. It always trusts. Even when Jesus is on the cross, one of his words to his own father is, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? But yet I still trust. You see, see, Paul has the image, he can write those words because he has the image of Jesus. The definition, the flesh and blood, the skin of really what love looks like. He, he told the woman at the well, look, I don't dig your lifestyle. What you're doing right now, that ain't good. Hey, by the way, the guy you're with isn't even your husband. But let me tell you something. I got something for you. 
One of the first appearances that Jesus makes publicly. <laughs> Is it a wedding of people that did not believe in the ways of the kingdom? <laughs> and he served at the wedding. It, it, it's interesting because Paul has the definition of love. And then it's this. It causes us to just ask the question, are we loving? Are we loving beyond disagreeing with lifestyles and methodology and all these different things? And are we loving? Usually when I, when I get to this point, I felt it last night Saturday, at the Saturday night service. Um, you start to get a little pushback in people's minds going, well, you don't know what my husband did. You don't know, you know what kind of woman I'm married to. You don't know what. I get it. I'm not saying there doesn't need to be boundaries. I'm not saying there doesn't need to be a season of healthy behavior to prove, to show love. And that's where these next couple of things come from. In your bulletin, your weekly handout there, I put that scripture. We have to ask the question, are we loving because... Paul goes on to say, love is patient, love is kind, love is not boastful, love is not rude. It, it, we get duped in society because we're told that love, by the way, look it up, Webster's Dictionary, you can look it up on, online, w, WebsterMiriam.com, whatever it is, or look up in a book or whatever. It actually, when you talk about love, it says see sexuality. What? What? For some of us, we're like, yeah. But, uh, but biblically, no, because we're, we're duped to saying that love is an emotion. No, it's not. What do we usually say? I fell in, yeah, like it's a ditch or something like that. Like it's some kind of, now, now some, of us, some of us are feeling like that. That's why we're in church, thank you, God. But the reality is, is some of us, we, we have these words that we say about love. You, you know, and, and it's not, just so we're clear, biblically, we're just seeing the words in red. And for some of us, it's going to transform our mind today. We're going to leave the house of God differently than when we walked in. It, it's completely different. It's, it's, what? Love is not an emotion. If you're a parent and you get up in the middle of the night because the baby's not quiet and you got to get up and who knows what you're going to find in the middle of the night in that crib, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't feel like getting up. I don't feel like getting up. It's because it's not based on emotion. It's not based, and, and I've been, it's been 23 years, and look, there are times, I'll say this, because my wife tells me she feels this way about me, there are times where she, I, I know she doesn't feel like loving me. I know it's hard to believe, and it's hard to fathom, <laughs> which I have never felt that way, babe, ever. <laughs> you can lie when you have a microphone. Watch, the idea is... It's not an emotion. It's very simple. When we're confused about which way we should go with things, I love the last line. I love what Paul says. He says, most of all, let love guide your life. Ah, what are you talking about? I got to be a doormat? I didn't say that. I got to just say it like it is. I got to tell them the way it is. That's half the Bible because one half says speak the truth. But the other half says, speak the truth in love. Doesn't mean you can't be truthful. Doesn't mean you can't be honest. Make sure you have many, many love deposits when you go to correct someone. Make sure you have many, many love deposits in their life in the form of serving and in the, in the form of words that give life before you go and put someone on the right path. That's what speak the truth in love means. Make sure you, you've earned the latitude. See, see, that's what Scripture says. It's interesting here, just so because we have to have takeaways here. Uh, my, my mind goes crazy if we don't have takeaways. So we can apply it on Mondays. We can apply God's Word on Mondays. That's what makes us changed in God's sight. Just understand, love is an action. It's not an emotion. Love is an action. Love is patient. Love is kind. <laughs> Love endures all things. Those are actions. So the question becomes, understand is just not something. It's this way. I love God in my heart. Got half the scripture right. 
That's why Jesus said, really? You want to know what's the most important? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, but love your brother as yourself because it's got to show up in action. You just can't, you don't just get to say, I love God, me and God, we're tight in our heart. Really? Because if you're that tight, it's got to show up in your speech, in the way your hands work for the kingdom, and the way your feet work for the kingdom. Love is an action, according to Scripture. And be careful, because culture will sweep you in a different way that it's not. Love is an action. Second thing, love's a choice. We have to choose to love every single day. We have to choose to love every single day. There is a moment in every person's life, at one moment or not, where we're going to choose X or be more patient, where we're going to choose to say blank or we're going to endure something, where we're not going. That's the idea I want us to get. And here's something I want you to write. It's not going to be on the screen. I want you to write this down. I just want you to get this. The idea of action and choice comes every day. But what love is, love is giving someone what they need, not what they deserve. That person, they just need a little bit more of my patience. That person, they need a little bit more of me understanding. Don't get me wrong, because here's the pushback. Well, when you say that, and we're in, and some of us are in tumultuous relationships, marital wise, uh, emotionally with other people, with our neighbors, with whatever, I get that. I've already clarified. Don't send me emails. Delete, delete. I got good at it. Watch. Make sometimes boundaries. Sometimes you go back and you try to reconcile, and that person doesn't want anything to do with you. Sometimes behaviors doesn't change, and you need to put distance. I get it. But the idea that Scripture says is love is an action and love is a choice. And it's not necessarily what I had to learn. It's not what, it's not what they deserve. Why? Because if you're really a believer and follower... I don't deserve God's forgiveness. I don't deserve his mercy, and I don't deserve his grace. And when I feel like I deserve it, I'm less loving with people. Why? Because this commandment, a new commandment, I give you, love one another like I love you. Like I love you. And when I have to bite a hole in my lip about something, sometimes... As I remember the patience that God has with me. So you just can't, you cannot act in a loving way horizontally without incorporating the love of your father vertically. See, see when, I, when I know I, it's hard for me to extend patience in an area, kindness. Look, man, I'm sitting at that, at that lunch table. I feel like I'm wasting my time because this guy's not listening. He's not listening to me. Go walk yourself. I don't care that your car is broken down. Go get a bus. Love is kind. 